we're talking to David Hancock, Hancock House Publishers and Hancock Wildlife uh, Foundation. Foundation, and Karen Bills, his left-hand lady today. And uh, we're talking about the Eagle Festival taking place up at Harrison in uh, November 21st, November 22nd, this next Saturday and Sunday. And he will be speaking himself at the Tapa de Oro Resort, 1 o'clock on Saturday, 1 o'clock on Sunday. And I've been there for his talks. And, you know, every time you go, you learn something more about eagles. And uh, I want to come back and talk because uh, can we talk about, you know, we got this bloody swine flu flipping around right now. And you are very uh, uh, vocal to me anyway and to the bit of the media about when we were out there flogging all the birds in the Fraser Valley. Because isn't there something about, you were talking about scavengers and eagles, and weren't the farmers throwing these birds out in the backyard type of thing, and eagles would come along and grab a bird and fly away with it? And so what, what's that all about? Because you're a biologist. You study this stuff. Well, it's about human greed, which most problems on the earth are about. There's one big issue, human greed, and the fact that there's too many humans and we're too greedy. And in this case, uh, we've allowed in the Fraser Valley one of these huge concentrations of what I call viral incubators. Incubators which are churning out viral pathogens at an incredible rate. And these are great commercial viral incubators. They're also known as broiler houses and, and chicken uh, commercial laying and, and, and hatchery houses. Um, but these chickens are usually raised 10,000 to a time, particularly in the broilers, I'll define the broiler system, in a big building. And they start off with thousands of chicks in a little area yeah. with a heat lamp. And, and a few days later, they have to widen that out because the chicks are eating it. Pretty soon they take away this boundary around them, and now they're free in this entire house. And throughout this big long house, and you see hundreds and hundreds of these out in the valley, um, you, you'll, these chickens are fed constantly, and now they can produce these chickens in about five and a half weeks. But from the moment those from chicks the egg, are, from the egg to the from when they're five, that's right when they're harvested for the supermarket. But there's a, obviously some mortality, and there's a kind of induced potential, potential for very high mortality because of this close proximity of all this living mass, and, and the living inside. mass of all these tiny little chicks getting bigger and bigger, the, each one of these is kind of a viral incubator. And if they get um, viruses in them, they can transmutate and so on and change from something that's relatively ineffective or non-lethal to something that can be lethal to chickens. But in some cases, the pathogen can mutate so that it's actually lethal to humans. And I guess my complaint is, number one, our greed is that we allow these in the Fraser Valley. That's an insanity in itself, again, based on greed. Because in that Fraser Valley, not only are there are million, two million people, two and a half million, but the Fraser Valley is one of the greatest flyways for wild migratory birds Absolutely. of the entire North American continent. Tens of thousands, or millions of, of waterfowl and shorebirds well, and songbirds. And sure. They're moving through this valley and then going north into Alaska to breed across the Arctic. Well, and they're going and right across to uh, Russia. They some of them, some of them are. Some of them will actually the get into Russia and come back again. Sure. Well, the problem here is that these viral incubators, after five and a half weeks in a broiler, where every day whoever dies is just trodden into the ground. Uh, among the poop droppings yeah. and so on, uh, of the rest of their friends, and it gets a thicker and a thicker and a thicker layer of droppings and dead birds. Uh, and I can it's see it now. Five and a half weeks, all the birds are taken out, slaughtered for the food market, and front-end loaders are driven into these buildings, and they scoop up this layer yeah. of, of droppings. Guano. Of guano. In some cases, because uh, before they used to take it and refeed it, yeah. Because there's a lot of protein well, in those droppings. They were feeding them to cows and stuff. Exactly too. what they were doing. But now that's being frowned upon in some areas. It's still happening in others. But they take that truckloads of all that droppings and dead birds, the ones that have died of in the something. Yeah. Yes, of something. 
and they take and dump it out onto the nearby farmland. Now, following the trucks that are spreading this it's dropping this flock of crows and well, eagles. the starlings, the crows, the pigeons, the gulls, and the eagles are just in behind this. I mean, it's amazing it's allowed. I mean, I have actually seen eagles come down and grab one of these dead chicken bodies and fly up. And I've actually seen them fly across the U.S. border carrying mm -hmm. one of these dead, contaminated yeah. chicken bodies and carrying it into the United States. I mean, we allow that. I mean, they're, of course, they're Americans. Take, they're particularly stupid that to allow us to do this. Yes. But somehow, greed overshadows everything, and, and we are still still doing it. And those viral incubators are out there today, ready to cause the next great pandemic to hit this area. And what are we going to do? Well, the first reaction is they go in and they kill all the surrounding wildlife. And in this case, I was told, I'm not sure if it's quite right, but I was told it was in the paper at the time, 92 million birds were killed the last time by the government, by the government killers. They kill all the people's pets in the area of these books. That's right. Uh, small farmers with their little backyard flock of chickens and ducks. If you had a, a parrot or a, 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 de, a, a pet budgie, they were all killed. All for the sake of our greed to allow those, if you'll pardon the word, bastards carrying on that kind of a, an activity right in the midst uh, of people and, and the flyway. Because that disease can then move north into the breeding grounds of all these birds, or if it's picked up on the birds coming back south, they pick it up and carry it all into the United States. I mean, it's an insane allowance, the chickens, but it's based on greed. And after all, it's eggs and so on that they're using to grow the H1N1 virus and almost our antidote to almost everything else, right? Chicken Nothing and better swines are two of the best Incubators. Uh, incubators. The swine is even better than chickens, and we have a lot of the swine incubators out here as well. So, you know, I, you hear about uh, the great worry and the concerns. It's not really concerns for you and I and the public. It's concerns that, my goodness, we better start al alarming people because we want to set up the position so that as soon as there's something happened, all our farmers will be able to reap the rewards of getting paid because they all get paid. Yep. They all get paid when their animals are slaughtered. So the farmers are, are always the ones to come out on top. No, there's nothing. Not, you can't say that David Hancock doesn't have an opinion. Anyway, David Hancock, <laughs> my guest, and uh, Karen, you've got to get your, you've got to sort of step up here and, put, <laughs> and say no. something to him. You know, he, he says you're the press man or press woman when he's not around. So, um, I'm around. Have, you, have, have you heard, I've got to ask, have you heard that particular uh, part before? I've heard the part about the chickens, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, I've uh, learned so much working with David. Well, it's, he's, he's just a joy. Uh, have you done a thousand mile trip with him <laughs> yet? Fountain of knowledge. I was so privileged I finally got to do the Alaskan cruise this summer. Oh, geez. And I lost track of how many people came up to us at the, well, I was on for two weeks. I did the one cruise up and then the one cruise back because I mm. um, uh, got a great deal at the end if you wait till the end of the season. You can get them for half price yep. uh, if you wait till three weeks before when you book. And so uh, when I was getting ready to book, David said, uh, well, I'll bet if you check the airlines, you'll find that you could stay on the ship for another week and come back home instead of flying home from Anchorage. Sure enough. So it was a great deal. Anyway, um, going up and, and, um, and coming back, at the end of both weeks, I don't know how many people came up to David and said, you made all the difference in this trip. I mean, some people just go to cruise for the luxury yep. of it. But if you're on there to learn about the wildlife and especially the eagles, because each week David gives four presentations on the ship. He does one on whales, one on eagles, of course, one on the glaciers and the wildlife are about you know around them, one on the native culture and the areas that we're passing. Just so informative. And then when he's not doing the presentations, he's usually up on the bridge and over the PA system. You can. Here I'm talking what's well, on the what's port side, by, yeah. what's on the starboard side. And so people that are going to get that experience, it makes a big difference whether the ship has a naturalist that's just graduated from college and doesn't know much, or if they've been, you know, studying them their whole lifetime like David has, because he doesn't just know about 
the wildlife. He knows about the, the plant life and the trees, and the, it's, it's just amazing well, the knowledge. You haven't knowledge lived until you've been driving down a, a little oh, muddy road God, in the middle of nowhere, and he suddenly <laughs> stops and goes and picks a mushroom out of the middle of the road that you then have for dinner, right? <laughs> you know, some big, big, big And mushroom. I don't know anything about mushrooms. I was only, as you may remember, I only fed it to you. I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Richard, I wish I had a camera on you. Richard's our producer, and if it wasn't for Richard, we wouldn't have that. So you had some mushroom too, David. I, I waited until you had the first bite. Anyway, making a long story short, 